Good day. I made this video in order that not everything will be forgotten. More than 50 years ago, a vernacular called Black Giant was put into operation in Duisburg Schwelkern. At that time, it was a new significant large blast furnace standard at Thiessen Steel Plant. Do you happen to know who has issued this video? My name is Werner Schweppes, and I was a repair welder at the Thiessen Steel Plant from 1969 until the middle of 1974. During my time there, I saw the construction of this huge blast furnace from the beginning, while performing repair work on the nearby sintering plants. This new blast furnace at the Schwelkern port was built with a frame vessel diameter of 14 meters and was the largest blast furnace in all of the European steel mills. Later on, I conducted some repair work on the blast furnace myself. My old friend Klaus Kates used to work at this blast furnace before we studied together. This video displays documentation of essential phases of the construction period, facilities, and initial pig iron production period, including events. On the 4th of November, 1969, the Thiessen Supervisory Board approved a new blast furnace investment for a giant blast furnace in Schwelkern. Subsequently Dr. Hans Gunther Sol, CEO of Thiessen announced that Schwelkern would set new standards for the blast furnace technology with the construction of a new large blast furnace with a vessel diameter of 14 meters. The planning was for a monthly production of around 250,000 tons of pig iron. The various new techniques that will be used. A furnace steel vessel with 14 meters frame diameter. Super hot wind generated by the wind heaters. Counter pressure at the blast furnace gout bell. Addition of oxygen to the blast furnace wind. Improved burden preparation. Feeding of the aggregates directly into the blast furnace by a conveyor belt transport system. Bell -a scout closure. A perfect location was chosen and on 5 January, 1970, the construction of this largest blast furnace in Europe began. An area of 17.5 hectares in the area of the port of Schwelkern was made available for the site. This location was an obvious choice for the following reasons. Lump iron ore is transported by the ships by conveyor belt directly into the aggregates of the new blast furnace. The necessary sinter is transported by the shortest route from the neighboring high-performance sintering plants 2 and 3 to the blast furnace bunker. When unclassified sizes of iron or ores are delivered, they can be classified in the nearby or crushing and screening plant and then transported by belt directly to the blast furnace or to its bunkers. In addition to pig iron, a blast furnace produces considerable quantities of slag, which are to be granulated as slag sand in the nearby port. The blast furnace plant is dependent on external purchases of iron ore, coke, and oil. In the Schwelkern area, it is now possible to handle long coke trains and tankers of all sizes very quickly and to feed the raw materials to the blast furnace by belt via bunkers and pipelines. Dr. Engineer Gerhard Heinert from the August Thiessen steel plant in Duisburg, who was very open to innovations, he gave the inventor of the Bell Lescout closure the chance and approval to install it into the new giant blast furnace at Schwelkern. The Cuckoo, as it had been christened by its inventor Edward Legill himself, began its first attempts at flight in songs. The new gout closure was not a further development, nor was it a simple attempt to break new ground. It was an invention, a revolutionary invention that was bound to cause astonishment among all blast furnace specialists in the world. For the time being, however, it was only a skeptical smile and an uncomprehending shake of the head, which soon turned into the greatest admiration when the first results became known. The requirements placed on a gout closure. 1. Gentle treatment of the burden materials, low drop height, few transfers. 2. Uniform distribution of the burden materials, even with large gout cross-sections. 3. Complete tightness of all shut-off aggregates to the atmosphere. 4. Little wear and tear. 5. Fast repair and replacement times. 6. Low investment, operating, and maintenance costs were fulfilled in all points by the Bell Les Paul Worth gout closure as from the later report number 521 of the Blast Furnace Committee of the Association of German Iron People, in which the first operating results were published. If you put the old, proven Bell gout closure next to the new Paul Worth Bell Les gout closure in a comparison, even a non-specialist can clearly see the huge differences. Understanding the blast furnace body, temperatures and supporting facilities a brief blast furnace process description. The blast furnace is a process for smelting iron ores to liquid pig iron, oxide iron ores are reduced to iron with the help of fossil fuels such as coke and coal. 
This is done according to the shaft furnace principle in counterflow, solids sink inside the furnace while the gas, which acts as a reducing agent, rises. The blast furnace is therefore one of the wandering bed reactors in which a fill moves through the shaft due to gravity. The reduction gas, which is also called shaft gas or rest gas, contains, among other things, the gases H2 and CO, which are produced by the combustion and gasification of the fuels or are contained in them and act as reducing agents. Typical blast furnace plants are shown here on some schematics in this video. From above, the so-called gout, the blast furnace is alternately loaded with solid feedstock aggregates and coke. In addition to various iron girders, the aggregates include limestone, in order to be able to bind the undesirable accompanying substances, the gate, in the form of a melting slag. At the lower end of the furnace, the rack, pig iron and slag are discharged via the tap hole, after the lumpy iron beams have sunk to the bottom for about 5 to 7 hours and have been reduced and melted at the same time. The aggregates begin to soften and melt in the shaft at about 1100 degrees Celsius. This is made possible by the carburization of the iron. Coal Processing Plant As shown in one of the coming slides finely ground coal is pneumatically blown in via the wind molds with nitrogen. The hot wind flows from the ring line through the nozzles, the coal is sprayed in with the lances. The main advantage of injection coal over coke is the lower price of raw coal. The raw coal delivered must be processed as show in the schematic on the left. The raw coal with a moisture content of approximate 10% is first separated from ferrous components with a magnetic separator and then conveyed into the raw coal silo with a steep conveyor. From there, the raw coal is discharged into a mill and ground and dried in a closed circuit. From the mill, the coal is discharged from the mill by a hot nitrogen gas stream and fed into a cyclone separator. The oversized grain, greater than 0.1 mm, is returned to the mill, the undersize with a residual moisture content of 1% goes through a heated filter into the fine coal silos. From there, the coal is pneumatically conveyed to the lances via a nitrogen injection vessel and blown into the blast furnace with the hot wind. Normally 100 to 120 kilograms of fine coal per ton pig iron are used. When the rate of oxygen content is increased let's say up to up to 38% in hot wind, the coal rates can be increased up to 220 kilograms per ton of pig iron. Schematic of the Cooper Heating Cycle the blast furnace process requires a continuous flow of hot blast, which is generated in the coopers. One cooper can only supply heat to a limited amount of hot blast until the stored heat in the checker work is drained and becomes insufficient for maintaining the high temperature of the hot blast. Therefore, three or four coopers are needed for a continuous flow of hot blast. The blast furnace processes use three coopers in Schwelkern, where one of the three is on blast, and the other two are heating. The picture on the left shows a schematic of the Cooper heating cycle, where the first two Coopers are on heating by combusting fuel gas, and the third Cooper is on blast. The operation of the giant blast furnace requires that the blast furnace gas must be enriched with a higher calorific value gas to be able to obtain the super hot wind temperatures for the modern blast required. Tuyer inputs. In the upper part of the frame, in the so-called mold plane, the hot wind, which is usually enriched with oxygen, is supplied via the blow mold see the picture on the left. In the mold level, energy reinforcements such as blowing coal or crude oil supplied via lances. In the flame chamber in front of the blow molds, which is called the vortex zone or raceway, the carbonaceous reactants are gasified and a hot reduction gas is produced with temperatures usually exceeding 2000 degrees Celsius. At this level of the furnace, this usually consists only of CO and N2 as well as small amounts of H2. The reduction gas then flows upwards within 5 to 10 seconds, reacting mainly with the sinking iron ore and supplying heat to the entire furnace. At the blast furnace, it leaves the blast furnace as blast furnace gas, which is then used to generate energy in the integrated steelworks. The construction of the giant blast furnace with a production capacity of 10,000 tons of pig iron per day. As stated before, the new blast furnace in Schwelgern has a usable volume of over 4,000 cubic meters. In accordance with the rapid development of the blast furnace process, all modern techniques are used in the new plant. A furnace of this size has so far only been commissioned in Japan in recent times. With this plant, the blast furnace construction and equipping industry will also be able to demonstrate its capabilities. 
Finally, a few figures may illustrate the size and scope of the construction measures for this gigantic project. Excavated soil 210,000 cubic meter. Formwork 140,000 square meters. Concrete work of 70,000 cubic meter. Installation of reinforcing steel 8,500 tons, which corresponds to an average reinforcement content of 121 kilograms of steel per cubic meter of concrete steel structure. 39,000 tons of steel were used. Plant area with all ancillary facilities, but excluding coke and iron or warehouses approximate 130,000 square meters. Furnace height above all, 120 meters above steel mill corridor. Height of the blast furnace crane lift 91 meters above the steel mill corridor. Furnace diameter 14 meters with a production capacity of 10,000 tons of pig iron per day. Steel chimney of the Cooper system height 145 meters foot diameter 9 meters outlet diameter 6 meters. Dr. Soul, Tyson CEO then referred to the new Tyson investments, which are now mainly aimed at the blast furnace side. In Ruhrort, a new 11-meter vessel frame diameter blast furnace will be ignited in the summer of 1971, and in Schwelgen the construction of a first large blast furnace with a vessel frame diameter of 14 meter has begun. As I told you before various new techniques, such as superhot wind, counterpressure at the blast furnace scout bell, addition of oxygen to the blast furnace wind, improved burden preparation and feeding of the aggregates by a continually conveyor belt transport system will also be used to further perfect pig iron production in the blast furnace. Here in February 1972, it is good that the blast furnace is growing fast but it is still one year away before the production of pig iron will start. In front of the picture, we can see is sintering plant 2 and 3 with the iron or crushing and screening plant. The harbor of Schwelkern is clear visible as well. The two pictures showing, installation of the blast furnace vessel in the autumn of 1970. The furnace head hangs in the mounting mast, the furnace vessel consists of steel plates with a thickness of up to 100 mm. Subsequently, as a world premiere the Bell Lescout closure system was installed. The cooling boxes are inserted into the upper cutouts as the picture on the left clearly shows. A closer look at the picture below shows us that there are 40 wind penetrations included. Here later the injection forms the super hot air will be installed. The picture here was made in July 1971 and shows the growing structural framework around the furnace vessel. As well visible is the large wind circulation pipe running around the furnace. On the left, the three super hot wind heaters each with an external combustion chamber. In front of the heater vessels lies the large exhaust manifold for the wind heaters. The welds in the picture are still rust colored and need to be cleaned and painted. On the far left is the 145 meter high chimney. This picture shows the assembly of the lower parts of the cyclone dust catchers for gas purification. At the edges of the image, you can see the supports of the dust catchers, which have a diameter of 7 meters, for the first purification of the blast furnace gas. After the gas passing through this purification, the blast furnace gas contains less than 5 milligrams of dust per normal cubic meter. In the background is the gas wet cleaning system, which has a recirculation water consumption of 3,000 cubic meters per hour. On the right a view of the not yet cladded the east casting hall in October 1971 with the blast furnace frame structure behind it. The pictures on the left and top were taken in July 1971 and showing some of the furnace frame structure around the furnace vessel itself. The picture on the left was taken in November 1971 and shows on the right, the wind heating vessel system. On the far right 140 meter high chimney. From the top left comes the belt conveyor bridge for the aggregates. The picture provides a view of the central control building, which is still scaffold in the gable. From this control room behind the bay window the operating sequence of the blast furnace is coordinated and managed. In the foreground, on the left, a part of the belt conveyor bridge for the aggregates. In the middle of the picture from left to right the driveway to the casting platforms, behind the control building on the left the oxygen system. The picture on the left shows the 150 meters high construction tower. The contractor Gute Hoffnung's Hut Oberhausen Sturkrate designed this tower especially for the execution of the construction work at this super large blast furnace. In the picture on the right shows a part of the structural framework. The view goes beyond the residential areas of Markslow, in the background the church tower of St. Peter. View of the northwestern area of the Schwelgen site with the Rhine River, 
at the upper left edge of the picture, in the foreground is the pipe bridge that connects the blower house behind it with the blast furnace. Below one more time the vessels of the wind heaters, the chimney on the left and the blast furnace vessel on the right. The wind heaters in their final stage. It looks like that the photograph focused more the stinging nettle than the wind heaters. On the left the picture shows the blast furnace in its final stage of construction. High temperature wind heaters with an external combustion chamber. Some of the internals of a wind heater. Refractory lining of dome and hot blast outlet and ceramic burner. The hot blast stove technology as used on the blast furnace Schwelkern 1 has progressed from a conventional stove with internal combustion chamber to high temperature stove with external combustion chamber. Hot blast stove consists of several parts which are referred to as 1. Combustion chamber 2. Ceramic burner 3. Dome 4. Regenerator which is a chamber containing a thermal storage and which is also being called checkerwork or the brick zone. Five crossover in case of a stove with an external chamber, and 6. Large walls. All these parts of the hot blast stove use refractory materials. The temperature of the dome area is very high and is around 1550 degrees Celsius in this high temperature modern stoves. The lifetime of a stove of over 30 years. The pictures on the left shows the open mine where the clays are extracted for the production of refractory products. An excavator is loading a truck with the clays of which later the refractory stones will be manufactured from. The shaped stones are placed on tunnel kiln wagons and fired in the tunnel kiln. After that, the refractory bricks leave the furnace and are then steel mill where material for many applications. Company Martin and Pargenstetcher, Kohl Mulheim, delivered the fire resistant stones. The following material were used 1. High alumina brick. 2. Fire clay brick. 3. Mullite refractory brick. 4. Corundum brick. The picture on the left shows the different furnace bricks ready to be shipped on the factory floor. This picture shows the inside of the blast furnace. Bricklayers building the refractory lining brick by brick. Stones that defy fire, inside of the blast furnace. Inside the blast furnace, it looks like this picture shows. The total number of fire-resistant brick stones is around 400,000. Temperatures reach up to 2,000 degrees Celsius inside this furnace. The new Thiessen Blast Furnace Schwelgen, 1, with a 14 meters frame diameter, a volume of 4,000 cubic meters and a daily specified production of 10,000 tons of pig iron, is currently the largest blast furnace western world. It started its pig iron production on the 6th of February, 1973 in the presence of many guests from business and politics for its inauguration. With its height of 110 meters, it forms a new, widely visible landmark in the industrial landscape of the Lower Rhine. The enormous production capacity of the new large blast furnace is illustrated by the fact that it consumes every day 20 complete freight trains of iron ore and coke. The amount of pig iron produced is so large that it can be continuously tapped. 50 large torpedo wagons have to be transported away every day each loaded with 200 tons of pig iron. The blast furnace pig iron quantity produced in Schwelgen, 1 is so huge that 10 years ago you would have needed 5 blast furnaces to produce this quantity. Even when we compare it with the most modern Thiessen's blast furnace in duisburg Ruhrort with 5,000 daily production the Black Giant has the double capacity. Since the beginning of February, Thiessen has had a new blast furnace plant at the port of Schwelgen. On the 6th of February, 1973 it was a Tuesday with some rain and a temperature of 6 degrees Celsius, the inauguration of the blast furnace in Schwelkern was happening. The Schwelgen, one blast furnace was decorated with the Thiessen flag on the gout, was inaugurated there in the presence of 500 guests from business and politics. Schwelgen, one is the first blast furnace in Thiessen to have a daily capacity of 10,000 tons of pig iron in a daily production, it is also the largest blast furnace in the western world. The elite of the German steel producing industry was present. 500 guests from business and politics at Schwelkern 1 listening to the speeches of high ranking Thiessen members. Plant director Dr. Engineer Gerhard Heinert announced that the wind heaters had already been fired up at the beginning of November 1972, that the blast furnace had been drying since December 1972 and had been filled with 900 cubic meters of wood, 3,300 cubic meters of coke. 650 tons of slag and 500 tons of ore in January 1973.
The blast furnace gas produced will supply Thiessen's Hamborn and Ruhrort power plants. Part of the electrical energy generated there will then flow back into the Schwelkern plant area. Then he gave the signal to light the gas pressed from Hamborn to Schwelgern and wished the blast furnace a happy journey at all times with a hearty gluckoff. The handover of the new Schwelgern I blast furnace to the plant and the ceremonial inauguration took place on the casting platform in front of a large circle of guests. Among them were retired steel plant director. Dr. Alfred Michel, third from left in the first row on the left. The Honorary President of the Association of German Iron and Steel Workers, Professor Dr. Schenk, fifth from left, and the former Chairman of the Works Council of Thiessen. Rudolf Judith, Board Member of the Metal Union, second from right. Thiessen CEO Dr. Sol beyond others inside the control room. All with happy smiles. We do not know what those managers and guests are looking to but it must be very interesting. The blast furnace control room full of visitors talking to each other. The tour lasted almost an hour, during which the guests were able to visit the new blast furnace under expert guidance after the inauguration and receive answers to all questions. Afterwards there was a delicious pea soup for the guests, managers, and the staff of the new blast furnace served. The picture on the right shows Professor Schenk sitting down with a smile waiting for his pea soup. Pea soup and a beer for the inauguration of the blast furnace was well received as well to some of the workers enjoyed the dish as well. This picture shows their faces on the day of the inauguration as I said before was a Tuesday with some rain and a temperature of 6 degrees Celsius. The young man on the left in the right picture I used to know but unfortunately, I forgot his name. Production, Investment and Environmental Problems The reason for the construction of the oversized steel giant was the growing demand for steel at the end of the 60s. For the new plant, which replaced some of the nine blast furnaces operated in Bruckhausen at the time, only the Schwelgern site was considered because the direct connection to the Rhine improved raw material logistics. With the commissioning of the Schwelgern one blast furnace, Thiessen advanced into dimensions that were previously unknown in producing pig iron. Thiessen invested a good 350 million DM, 175 million euros, in the plant, 15% of the construction costs alone were attributable to facilities for environmental protection. Never before had Thiessen and the Trade Inspectorate applied stricter environmental standards than in the construction as it was done for this Colossus furnace at Schwelgern Harbor. Examples where the high standards of environmental measures are the dedusting of aggregates and during the blast furnace pig iron slash slag tapping, the gas purification, strong water treatment requirements and for sound insulation to the entire facility. Even with the implementation of all those environmental protection measures citizen protests over noise pollution increased and became a major problem. Only four weeks after the commissioning of the blast furnace there was even a threat of shutting it down the facility. The state labor inspectorate complained that the specified environmental conditions had not been met. Thiessen lodged an objection to the closure of the Schwelgern, one blast furnace order. The court process ended with a settlement, the blast furnace was allowed to continue producing, but Thiessen had to significantly reduce the noise and dust level within one and a half months. At this time the myth of the black giant was born. After the implementation of extensive additional environmental measures, the blast furnace only whispered a year later, and the dust load also decreased noticeably. Those initial difficulties have almost been forgotten in Duisburg. The blast furnace is now a part of the cityscape in Marks Low and Walsum and it is still one of the most powerful and modern in the world. In 1996 it was thoroughly modernized, a new delivery it is called in technical jargon. For 85 days, the steel giant took a vacation after a total of 10 years of furnace travel. Furnace travel is the name of the production time between the furnace operation and to get refurbished again for the next cycle. Many things were renewed during the major refurbishment. From the wind heaters and charging equipment to the cooling system and many pipes. Where temperatures usually reach up to 2000 degrees Celsius, masons were at work to replace the worn out refractory brickwork. A total of 450,000 stones were replaced. The central control room was also brought up to the latest state of the art. The blast furnace is controlled from the major control room and all processes of the furnace can be queried and influenced from there at any time. The wind heaters are now preheated with the waste heat from a neighboring sintering plant. Since 1973 Thiessen has been using a part of the heat contained in the exhaust gas of the wind heaters to heat around private 5,000 homes via an installed district heating network. Process inputs outputs and process outputs materials. 
20 kilometers of conveyor belts. The foreign aggregates such as coal, limestone, ores arriving in Schwelgern mostly on the River Rhine by pusher boats. Here in Schwelgern a 20 kilometers long conveyor belt system transports the aggregates to the processing plants for adequate smelting preparation and subsequently the refined aggregates will be either placed directly into the new blast furnace or the associated storage areas. This transport system is also connected to the supply of coke which is delivered in large capacity trains with self-unloading wagons to be emptied in the bunkers and subsequently from there transported to the blast furnace. The more than 300 start and finish points of this conveyor belt network are switched from a single control room, similar to a train track interlocking system. An automatic recording of the quantities and stocks is produced. Here an early stage computer system was installed as well. You will see it on subsequently slides here in this video. Remark, only in the year of 2003 was a coke plant opened at Schwelgen. The processed iron ore is mixed with aggregates such as limestone, quartz sand, and fluor spar before being filled into the blast furnace. This helps to bind undesirable accompanying elements in the form of slag during the blast furnace process. The blast furnace, which has a capacity of 4,000 cubic meters, is filled with aggregates like cokes and iron or through a conveyor belt, rather than a hunt. However, this process used to be quite noisy and needed to be quieter. To reduce the residual noise from the conveyor belt, approximately 1,700 square meters of sound absorbing panels were installed. To decrease the noise and dust level from the furnace filling activities, environmental protection isolation walls were installed on the bell less gout of the furnace. The conveyor belt transports aggregates to the top, which then enter the furnace through the gout bell. This conveyor belt consumes a lot of electricity. The sparks fly at the big blast furnace. It is clear to see here in the picture that the conveyor belt reaches the top of the furnace and transports all aggregates into the newly developed bell less gout closure. The overhead gout crane as installed here needs only a lifting capacity of 30 tones. The picture on the left shows a tapping of the blast furnace. Remember some of the following chemical reactions that occurred during the production in the middle part of the blast furnace. Carbon monoxide serves as a reducing agent for the gradual reduction of the iron oxides and later to elemental iron including the Boudouard reaction as shown in this slide. The amount of pig iron produced is so large that it can be continuously tapped. Pig iron tapping and slag tipping. In integrated steel mills, the production of one ton of pig iron produces around 300 kilograms of blast furnace slag as a byproduct. What is coming out here? It is liquid pig iron that is removed from the blast furnace at approximately 1450 degrees Celsius during tapping. 50 torpedo wagon filled with pig iron pulled out by a locomotive large torpedo wagons have to be transported away every day. Torpedo wagons being filled with pig iron each wagon running on 16 axles. Pig iron transportation control center in Hamborn. As shown in the two slides before, the pig iron is transported by rail to the Thiessen steelworks in torpedo pan wagons of 16 axles with a capacity of 140 tons. Approximately 25 tons of pressure are transferred to the rails via each axis. Up to three such wagons can be carried by an 800 horsepower diesel locomotive of the joint railway and ports operation. The shortest possible circulation of these torpedo pans is controlled and monitored by a pig iron control center in Hamborn. It centrally monitors the transport flow of often more than 30,000 tons of pig iron per day between the group's blast furnace and steel mills. Most of the pig iron was delivered to the oxygen steel mill 1 and 2. Here is a picture of the oxygen steel mill 1 in Bruckhausen which needs a lot of pig iron and it has the capacity to store 5,000 tons in two storage mixers and the filling of pig iron into the converter in oxygen steel mill 2 in Beakerworth. The blast furnace electricity consumption and power supply. The switching on and off of the many hundreds of drive motors installed throughout the plant is concentrated in three large control rooms located in the close vicinity to the blast furnace. All modern tools, especially electronics, are used here in order to be able to monitor and control the operational process from these points. Later in this video is the early computer control explained. The electricity consumption of the Schwelgen Blast Furnace Works corresponds to the generation of the Thiessen power plant in Alsom with around 100 MW. This was the producing capacity of the Thiessen power plant in Alsom in 1973. Most of the fuel gas used here is supplied via the 2.8-meter pipeline coming from the Schwelgen Blast Furnace, 1. 
This picture shows the Hermann Wenzel power plant at Ruhrort with a view from Friedrich Ebertstrasse and the Oberhausen power plant. Since October 1, 1969, Thiessen's two Duisburg power plants, the Hermann Wenzel power plant in Ruhrort and the Hamborn power plant, have covered the electricity requirements of the Thiessen steel plant area as well as the affiliated group companies and some neighboring industrial companies. Since the 1st of October 1972, the Oberhausen power plant has also been integrated into the Thiessen power grid area in order to increase the economic efficiency of the entire electrical energy supply. Since then, 12 turbine sets have been operating for the electrical power supply of the Thiessen area. For this purpose, three turbine sets with a total of 128 megawatts are available in the Hamborn power plant, four turbine sets with 418 megawatts in the Ruhrort power plant and five smaller turbine sets with 66 megawatts in the Oberhausen power plant. This brings the total installed capacity of Thiessen's power plants to 612 megawatts in 1973. Due to the different sizes of the individual power plant units and the different levels of energy input the central control room in Duisburgbeek has the task of making optimal use of the individual machine sets depending on the availability and work schedule of the consumers. The pictures showing the electrical substation control center of the Thiessen power plants in Duisburgbeek including its control board. This electrical substation in Beek as shown in the picture is located close to the old Emscher pump station house adjacent to the Hofstrasse. Measures to reduce the blast furnace noise have been successful as shown here. In the case of the snort valve of the wind line, the noises generated by the regular blowing off of the entire amount of cold wind had to be dampened in such a way that the nearest residential building about 400 meters away did not exceed 35 decibels. The task, which was satisfactorily solved by three improvements, was made more difficult by the fact that the wind in the pipe has an overpressure of 3 to 4 atm, which relaxes to 0 atm when blown off. The air must be blown off almost inaudibly during this process. A snort valve is a butterfly valve which installed in the cold blast line main before the stove normally located near the blast furnace. It is used for reducing or completely stopping the air blast to the BF without stopping the operation of the blower. Fuel consumption and water management. The Schwelgen 1 blast furnace produces a lot of heat and has a total fuel consumption similar to a 650 MW electric power plant. Such a power amount would be sufficient to supply all Duisburg households with electricity. It is therefore understandable that the entire plant is dependent on intensive and well-controlled water cooling. Based on this almost 100 water pumps are installed at the plant for the purposes of cooling, gas purification and the transformation of blast furnace slag into granulate. All the water is recycled in about a dozen different circuits. The cooling systems of the entire Schwelgen blast furnace plant do not use any water of the Rhine River. The picture is showing some of the filter drums in which the water is circulating. In slide 59, considering the water that is needed to cool the blast furnace vessel and its ancillary equipment this water alone is circulated in eight different circuits by using around 40 individual pumps. Supplementary water is taken from the public water supply. A further, self-contained water circuit is used to purify the blast furnace gas. The water from this is cooled in a clarifier basin with a diameter of 35 meters and then in a cooling tower system. Here as well those facilities have no direct connection to the River Rhine. Rather, the sewage pond of these facilities is drained via the Emscher and its sewage treatment plants if it becomes necessary in the event of any repairs. The picture is showing some of the installed associated piping, pips including electrical motors in the pump house. The picture shows the water cooling towers and water cleaning system. The site of the blast furnace plant has two separate sewer systems for the wastewater. One is about 4 kilometers long, absorbs only rainwater and leads it into the Rhine, while the other is 3 kilometers long and directs the process water summarized here to the nearby Emscher sewage treatment plant as shown in the picture on the right. In the picture on the left the large filtering system for blast furnace sludge separation. Measures to reduce noise have been successful. In the case of heavy industry plants such as Thiessen, in the immediate vicinity of which there are residential areas, noise problems are particularly stressful. This is because traffic noise is already a nuisance for dwellings due to their inadequate soundproofing design, so that noises falling at night are perceived as particularly distressing. These are factors that can easily turn noise problems in living areas into an unreasonable burden. While in all other areas of environmental protection, modern equipment usually represents progress, the same cannot be said in terms of noise. 
Essential features of modern high-performance systems are powerful and therefore loud electric motors as well as working with high process pressures. If their permissible limits are exceeded, the safety devices respond with high sound intensities. In addition, the companies that build soundproofing equipment are often faced with tasks for which the necessary experience must first be gained and which can therefore often only be mastered satisfactorily after several improvements. The picture on the left shows that a silencer of the blast furnace hot wind line 20 meters above the steel plant floor was installed to bring noise levels down. This silencer is huge and it has an impressive height of 11 meters. To the four safety pressure relief lines of the three blast furnace wind blowers and the compressor of the oxygen plant more silencers were added see picture on the left. The function of those additional silencers is that in a case of an emergency air blow off to contain the increased noise levels to the specified level of 50 to 55 decibels measured at the nearby housing compound. The crusher building of the sintering plant received a porch to prevent noise from escaping from the opening for the assembly crane see the picture on the right. At the cooling tower in Schwelgern, above, it did not stay within the permissible 35 decibels and was dampened by an attachment consisting of four layers of precast concrete elements with sound absorbing elements. The 750 meter long Petersburg, which was built and greened in 1960 with a height of 20 meters between the Schwelgern plant and the Schwelgern park, has now been extended by 170 meters to the south parallel to the Alsumer Steeg. As a result, its shielding effect for the houses on Wiesenstrass visible in the background could be significantly improved. The old part has now been raised by 1.2 meters and additionally planted with shrubs. May June 1973 In May 1973 the noise level of the oxygen plant air compressor was decreased as well by adding an isolation housing that covers the entire compressor. The Blast Furnace Gas Consideration of the New Blast Furnace as a byproduct, the blast furnace gas is a key component of the metallurgical process and is a part as we all know of the entire energy consumption of a steel plant and associated power plants. Due to an expected further reduction of the coke charge in the new large blast furnace, the normally obtained accumulated gas will be significantly reduced. That means that the construction of a modern large blast furnace will have an impact on the gas energy availability. The specified own use of blast furnace gas goes down from around 35% to approximately 20%. However, a problem is that the operation of this blast furnace requires that the blast furnace gas must be enriched with a higher calorific value gas to be able to obtain the super hot wind temperatures for the modern blast required. The calorific value of blast furnace gas is 4 kilowatt hour per cubic meter and for natural gas around 8 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. This is a huge difference. Expanded Blast Furnace Gas Pipeline Network Between Hamborn and Ruortlar The blast furnace gas after purification has an approximate composition as shown in the table in the picture as well as some water vapor and traces of methane. Some amounts of the blast furnace produced gas will be transferred to the Hermann Wenzel and the Alsum power station. Therefore, a 2.8 meter diameter pipeline was built as shown on the following slides. The picture on the left shows some gas pipes on a blast furnace and a table with the gas composition of furnace gas. For reasons of energy interconnection, a high-pressure blast furnace gas pipeline has been built between the new blast furnace in Schwelgern and the high-pressure power plant, Hermann Wenzel, in duisburg kurortlar in 1972. After its commissioning, it connected the black giant large blast furnace in the port of Schwelgern with the Ruortlar electrical power plant. This pipeline resulted in an optimal supply of blast furnace gas to the two Thiessen power plants in Hamborn and Ruortlar. Optionally, the blast furnace gas flowing through this pipeline can be fed to Hamborn or Ruortlar, or both power plants can obtain the blast furnace gas at the same time. The giant blast furnace will feed its blast furnace gas directly into this pipeline. Inevitably, since public land was crossed, the construction of this line could not remain hidden and was visible to everyone. In addition, this pipeline has a nominal diameter of 2,800 mm, more understandable for laymen, the inner diameter is 2.80 m. Since the line stands on supports with a relatively wide distance, it had to be fitted with reinforcement rings. Those prevent the huge pipes from bending. As a rule, the distance between columns is 30 m, the largest distance here is 56 m. The picture on the left shows the gas pipeline and the giant blast furnace in the back. The blast furnace gas pipeline as I told you before connects to the Thiessen power station Hermann Wenzel in Ruortlar. 
Here at the power plant, the furnace gas will be burned to generate electrical power. In some cases during the pipeline construction, it was necessary to divert road traffic for a few hours, for example when crossing the Hofstrasse between Beek and Beekerworth and when crossing Friedrich-Ebertstrasse between Ruhrortlar and Beek. With the help of large truck-mounted cranes, the work went smoothly, sometimes conducted at night. I have to add here on this occasion as a personal note that I know this pipeline and this crossing and saw it when it was built. At this time, I was only thinking this thing is big but I did not think that I would become a pipeliner at a later stage in my life myself. The 110-inch, 2.8-meter, blast furnace gas pipeline with the reinforcement rings was built in the year 1972. This blast furnace gas pipeline I have to say snake monster with the reinforcement rings wends its way through industrial subports areas of northern Duisburg of has now operating for more than 50 years and still transports gas from Schweldren to Hermann Wenzel power station in Duisburg Ruhrortlar. When I was working still at Thiessen at the beginning of the 70s I passed this place at Elsummer Street many times when I was on the way to my work to Thiessen Gate No. 13. This picture shows the slag tipping out of a slag pan. Blast furnace slag and the question what is slag actually? Slags are a mixture of calcium oxide, magnesium oxide aluminum, and iron oxide, which is added during the smelting process in blast furnaces or metallurgical furnaces and serves to remove impurities from the iron ore or steel scrap. In addition, the slags protect the liquid metal from external oxygen and maintain the necessary temperature by forming a so-called lid. Since the slag is lighter than the liquid metal, it floats on top and can be easily removed. A typical chemical composition is shown in the table below. What happens to the slag afterward? The still liquid slag is poured into so-called slag beds for cooling. From there, it goes on to the processing plant to recycle the cooled and hard slag. How can slag be recycled? The steel mill as well as the blast furnace is ideally suited as an equivalent for natural stone qualities such as diabase, basalt, or greywack. After processing, it is processed into ecologically sensible products in accordance with the relevant environmental guidelines, which are used, for example, in road construction and landscaping. They can also be used as drainage for sports and riding fields, as a basic material for asphalt layers, and as a frost protection layer in road construction. This is a beautiful colorful picture of tipping liquid blast furnace slag. Granulating at the blast furnace, what I saw in a cement plant. As far as I can remember, there was a problem with the automatic granulation of the slag on the new blast furnace. Only after six months the transport pipes were damaged due to internal surface friction caused by the granulate water mixture. Those pipes had to be reinforced from the outside with prefabricated half shells. I myself was there in mid-1973 and welded the half shells to the damaged pipes. Furthermore, the granulation tanks often ran over and the hot granulate mixed with water was spilled on the hot floor. This granulate flew around the blast furnace and settled down between the rail tracks as well. The granulate looked like sand and some people who didn't know that it had spilled over walked into it and burned their feet from the hot water. Not very pleasant such an accident. I don't know if the system is still working today or whether it got replaced. The purpose in the middle of 1973 was to produce cement with the following method. The blast furnace cement to be produced in Schweldren will consist of 60% blast furnace slag sand as well as 35% cement clinker and 5% gypsum. The cement clinker will be delivered to Schweldren from one of the various plants of the Rhenish Kochstein work, and the gypsum will also come from outside. The Schwelgen site was mainly due to the fact that the most important and in terms of volume most important raw material for the production of blast furnace cement in Schwelgen is granulated blast furnace slag. Their transport route from the Schwelgen 1 blast furnace to the grinder is very short. The picture shows nice granulate being piled up by a conveyor band. The cement mixing plant that works with granulate. This slide number 75 shows the architectural drawing of the cement plant from April 1973. The blast furnace cement grinder intended for Schwelgen, the approval procedure for which has not yet been completed, will not have a kiln plant and will be constructed in such a way as to take full account of all the environmental protection measures currently known. A smiling employee with granulate made out of slag in his hands. With its operational start in February 1973, computers, control, of the blast furnace was used and the following was reported. In 1966, the first online control of a blast furnace by a computer system was implemented in Ruhrort. 
It was then possible to build on this experience gained in Ruhrort at the Hamborn Blast Furnace Plant and now at the Schwelgen Blast Furnace for model development on the part of research. For the large blast furnace in Schwelkern, a Siemens 306 double computer system was installed in the central control room of the Black Giant, in accordance with the scope of tasks and safety considerations. The system is organized in such a way that, in normal operation, one computer is assigned the programs written by the Mathematical Department of Research, mainly for process control tasks. The second computer takes over other takes as the acquisition of measured values that are about 700 analog and 300 digital values as well as operational reporting. The significance of the use of these modern process computers for blast furnace operation lies essentially in the exact calculation, disposition and control of the aggregates. Here it is an absolutely necessary prerequisite for a uniform kiln cycle and for achieving the required pig iron quantity and analyses. Furthermore, in the output of important information about the course of the process this means temperature behavior of the blast furnace. Operation of the wind heaters, by displaying and logging numerous measured values and operating characteristics determined by the computer via screen or teleprinter as well as in the processing of operational reporting. At the beginning of 1973, in the presence of Director Schutte and Chief Engineer Whistle, the new IBM 370 computer system with the models 155 and 145 was put into operation in the central data center of the technical data processing. Instead of the previous IBM 360 systems, this powerful dual system now forms the core of a wide-span network system in which planning computers, process computers and data stations in the production plants and technical staff units of Thiessen are included. Almost at the same time, this composite system was also expanded to include a significant installation on the periphery. Since the commissioning of the blast furnace giant Schellkern 1, the Siemens 306 computer system used there has been recording and processing the measured values and data generated for production control and process management. Thus, at the beginning of 1973, two important events occurred on the way to an increasingly comprehensive technical control and information system which is intended to provide increasing support for the tasks of production plants and technical staff units. The history of Thiessen's technical data processing is not short of such events. The schematic on the left shows the integration of the installed systems. The two pictures show on the left Director Schutte and Chief Engineer Whistle in the Bruckhausen Data Center after commissioning the new IBM computer. On the right the operation of large computer systems can be seen that requires care and concentration and in addition special expertise that was available in the Bruckhausen Data Center. Today, the management of a blast furnace operation also requires the use of modern computer systems. The picture shows the Siemens 306 system process computer for the Shellkern 1 blast furnace. Thiessen's first online computer with almost 70,000 operating hours is in use at the Schwelkern or Handling Facility for tracking and monitoring material movement. It has to be stated here that the real implementation of the use of EDP for process control in the blast furnace area and the automatic function control of the individual processes was happened in 1987. At this time a complete electronic process control at Blast Furnace Schellkern 1 took place. Accident at the Black Giant Blast Furnace on 6 January, 1989, on Epiphany, there was a major operational accident at the Black Giant. At around 8 p.m., the engineer on duty at the time, Dr. Engineer Gerd Poth, was called from the control station of the large blast furnace with the words, Doctor, you have to come immediately, the furnace is going through. In the background explosions could be heard on the telephone, which was still analog at the time. There had been a pig iron breakthrough at the furnace below tap hole 2 and more than 1,000 tons of pig iron and slag found their way out into the open. Fortunately, all employees were able to escape the danger by fleeing at the time, but the operational damage caused by this accident was immense. The water escaping from the double armor of the furnace's vessel and the molten pig iron along with slag led to a never-ending chain of explosions that caused large-scale destruction. After four months, the blast furnace team, together with all the auxiliary troops of the smelter and the specialist companies called in, had restored the blast furnace and peripherals to such an extent that it could be blown on. My personnel remark, at this time if I remember right, I heard from this accident at the block giant but it was for me more or less a non-event because I still had in my mind the horrible North Sea Piper Alpha oil platform accident that killed 167 people six months earlier since I worked close with Occidental on a bid for the Iraq the Rumela. Oil field together. 
My old friend Klaus Kaths who used to work at the Black Giant Blast Furnace, I met him the last time here in Bangkok in 2003 but his relationship with this Blast Furnace ended in the middle of 1974. Thank you for watching this video of the Black Giant.